Hello everyone, welcome to the sixth and final video in our Gifted series. Um, it's really been a good time and uh, tonight we're looking at, at my personal, one of my personal favorite gifts, the gift of leadership. We're going to look at practical ways to grow the gift of leadership. The reality is all of us have inside of us the raw materials to be a leader. God has leadership in him, he's creative and he's given us in our DNA, uh, leadership at our core. And so all of us have, to a greater or lesser extent, the, the material to lead out of. And uh, I believe God wants us to grow in that gift. Now our design, like we had in the first week, and how to grow in that design. I have a recurring memory of my primary school years where I remember as a seven, eight, nine, ten year old on the soccer field, um, and there was inevitably a soccer match before school during the small break and the lunch break where, you know, stacks of boys were waiting for a football game to start. There were probably 10 games on at the same time. As many balls as there were, there were as many games on the go. And my memory is always been the third or fourth last boy to be picked for a game. Now, I wasn't built for sport and I really had no skill at all on the football pitch. But my, my memory is really being left almost for last. And I didn't grow up with a natural uh, skill at leadership, I think set back by some of those memories. And so I've had lots of opportunities to lead over the, the years gone by. And I've enjoyed it and I've, I've, I've loved leading. But the reality is almost every time I'm called to lead, I have got a natural uh, fear wonder whether I'm the right person for the job, maybe they've picked the wrong person. I can think of stacks of people better qualified than I am for the job of leadership, um, but I've loved it nonetheless. And so I want to talk tonight about this, this reality that we call to lead, even though we don't always feel qualified to lead. There's a verse, Romans 12, 6 to 8, our text, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is to lead, that's the word, do it diligently. What a beautiful thing to get to lead. The next little word there, this is a gateway gift. I love that. I love that this is a gateway gift. In other words, it sets others up for success. So servant leadership creates room for others to soar. It's a gateway gift that allows other people to fly in their giftedness. It creates room for other people to soar. Now, selfish dictatorial leadership, the way the world sometimes leads, is not the Bible pattern. The Bible way is to lead in a way that's selfless, that deflects attention off the leader and makes room for those coming after them to fly in their own giftedness in their own space. The best story I know to make this point, it's a funny story, but it's, I can't think of a better way to make the point. Our second son, uh, Noah, was probably seven, eight or nine years old when he uh, was in his heyday at junior school on the rugby field. He was probably the second smallest boy in the grade. He was a tiny guy, he was wiry, he was quick, he was skillful, but he wasn't built for massive impact in a, a rugby game. But he was made to look exceptionally good. He was good, but made to look better by two of his teammates. Uh, he was obviously the scum off because of his size, but he had two good friends who were a set of twins and they were called the Booties, that was their nickname. Great boys, really good lads, but they were strong, and they were big, and they had an impact in the team. And so the putties would basically just smash into the opposition, and there'd be little bits of little boy flying off them, and there'd be carnage, and grandmothers crying on the side, and patching together their sons, and, and there'd be medics coming to you know, bring CPR on the side of a, a grade four rugby game. But as the putties brought carnage, they made a highway through the opposition, and the little scrum off, my boy was able to score try after try after try with wide open space. What a picture of good leadership from these two big boys making space for somebody else to come and to soar. So leadership, godly gift of leadership, is a gateway gift making space for others. So four practical points, practical ways to grow this gift. The first is the bad news. It's the scary news, the stuff that you all want to hear from me today. But it's, you only grow, first word, outside of your comfort zone. 
Now, most of us don't want to hear that. We want to grow in a comfortable space on a sofa with a nice fire, some slippers on and some hot chocolate under a blanket. But that's not how leadership develops. You're only going to grow this gift outside of your comfort zone. Turn over the page to that, that uh, diagram there. We don't know who that diagram comes from, it's anonymous, but it's a fantastic uh, figure that just shows this point practically. The first circle there is the comfort zone. You feel safe, control everything. It's set at your pace. It's what you like to be and do. It's the comfortable space in your life. Outside of that zone is the fear zone, where you're affected by other people's views. You're afraid, you find excuses, your self-confidence gets knocked. That's the sweaty palm, pulse rate, high kind of a zone where you really feel out of your depth. Once as you do that, you go into the learning zone. Develop new skills, there's a steep growth curve. You, you kind of learn how to find solutions to problems and challenges and, and you extend what is your comfort zone. What used to be a small zone of comfort, you've now grown into and you've learned some stuff and you're now comfortable in a bigger space. And of course beyond that, the other place you designed to live by God, first one being the learning zone, but you're now designed to live as well in the growth zone. That's where you, you set new goals, you find your objectives conquered, you live your dreams, and you find the purpose that God's given to you. The reality is you go through these zones and sometimes you fail in the growth zone. You have fears, you have disappointments, and you feel some pain, and you want to run back, you want to beetle back to your, your comfortable lumble lounge under your blanket with the fire, with some marshmallow or chocolate and some slippers, because that's where you want to go. But actually, we're designed to live in the learning zone and in the growth zone. You only will grow in the place of learning and growth outside of your comfort zone. Okay, back to uh, our practical points. Second point, willingness is more important than knowledge. Isn't that so liberating? That, that God designs us with this in mind. We are not perfect. We don't have all the skills. There's nothing sadder than seeing somebody who has skills, who has ability, who has the goods to lead, but they postpone their leadership because they think, I'm not ready to lead. I will lead one day when I am dot, dot, dot. Actually, willingness is a lot more effective and important to setting us up to lead than skill and knowledge might be. What a great text, Judges 5 verse 9. The story here is Deborah, who was a judge set up by God to help lead God's people. And the context was the people who were qualified to lead, the people who should have been leading, they weren't leading because they were unwilling to lead. And this woman of God who God sets up to lead his people she sees this and she suddenly sees the joy when the people do start leading and she sings the song. She says, my heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. Scriptures are full of stories of men and women, boys and girls, who weren't the obvious choice. The pedigree wasn't right. Their birth wasn't right. They didn't look the best, but they were willing. And so God did incredible exploits through them because of their preparedness to get involved. I want to compliment those of you across the sites, across the connect groups, who day in and day out lead willingly. You aren't perfect. We aren't always successful. We don't have all the goods, but we're willing, and you try, and you keep on going, and God brings incredible fruit. I want to compliment you and say I want to commend you. You deserve a massive shout-out. Well done. Thanks so much for what you do. The thing about willingness is it sets you up to be able to ask for help. Because if you lead because you think you're perfect, you don't think you need then to ask for help. But if you lead because you're willing, knowing that you aren't perfect, you're going to be prepared to say, can you help me please? I don't know the answer. I'll come back once I've found the answer. What a great place to live, being able to, to lead out of willingness and not always perfect skill at the thing. The third practical point, seek out wise counsel. I think you knew the answer there. Why, wise counsel. There's two different versions of the same verse which give the same truth at different levels. Firstly, for lack of guidance, a nation falls. But victory is won through many advisors. That's the NIV version of the verse. 
The ESV says, where there's no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there's safety. What a beautiful text. What a great chunk of wisdom. And it's applicable in this area of leadership. You see, we've got to grow in leadership. We don't have all the goods. We don't have it all together. None of us knows all the answers about everything. But as we humble ourselves and recognize the need to take on the wisdom of others, our leadership skill, our ability grows practically. Imagine a church where all of us were prepared to draw on the wisdom of the people around us. I don't mean a heavy, you know, hectic, burdensome thing of you know, having hours and hours every day of, of being mentored, but being mentored by, by organic, on the journey, preparedness to ask questions, systematically where there's, you know, you're committed to, to, to times with certain people, but also a heart condition where we're open to being led and helped and mentored. A skill, I think, is learning the ability to ask questions. I've got some friends who, who ask lots of questions, and they're constantly growing their leadership gift. One guy I know, we've been mates for well over, you know, over three decades, really, and this man hasn't got a degree or a formal diploma, but I don't know many men who are as wise as this guy, who are as, as godly as this guy, who are as skilled at leadership as this guy. But that guy's secret is he's always asking questions. He'll ask questions of old people, of young people, of men, of women, of, of, of different kinds of people. He lives like a sponge prepared to absorb wisdom, godly wisdom from those around him. He's always reading good books, godly books. He's always in the Bible. He's constantly learning because he's prepared to draw wisdom from those around him. No one knows the answers. We should be prepared to ask lots and lots of questions. The fourth point, what a great little, little point. Be a team player. If you want to be a good leader, you ought to be a good follower. It sounds counterintuitive from the world, the world's point of view, where in the world leaders are the main one, the main guy, always you know, making it happen for themselves. But godly biblical leadership is, is demonstrated by being under authority because we have authority. And that's the verse there, Matthew 8, verse 9. Christ talking to a, 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 an officer in the Roman army, says, the guy says to him, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And the principle there is, I can lead as I am led. Good leaders are good followers. Team player, what does that mean? I want a, a military picture which I think makes this point so well. You think of all the great militaries over the years, whether, whether it was a physical combat, not, not the modern, modern military where you press a button and something flies across an ocean, but back in the day when there was hand-to-hand -hand combat and how wars were fought like that. The Romans, the Spartans, Isizulu uh, Impi, those military machines worked best when men locked shields together and they provided an impenetrable force. As they lockstep into their future, team meant they took great territory. They were able to lead the, the rest of the army as the front ranking guys locked in as team together. Under authority, they therefore had authority and fruitfulness. We need to be team players so we can grow together. You think of, of your sport days, whenever you played in a team sport or play in a team sport, whether it's you know, hockey or soccer or rugby, whatever the case may be, you're thinking right now of that guy, that girl who was so famous, they had their own brand, they designed their own branded label clothing. They were like just always about number one about themselves. No one likes that guy. Don't be that guy. Be the team player who wants to make the team succeed, not have your, your name in lights and you being the only one. I'm going to end with, with the two things to watch out for. Just two parting comments, two, two more practical things, but just two anchors to keep us growing in this gift of leadership. The first is this. It's not a Bible word, but it's something that God, uh, Christ referred to. Don't forget the golden rule. What's the golden rule? Luke 6, verse 31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Remember, we're talking about to all of us on how to grow our gift of leadership. Practically, I want to say to us, 
if you think about how you've been led, that's a good way for you to lead. In other words, when you think about the stuff that you enjoyed being led into, the ways you've enjoyed being led by good leaders, we should try and do those things. Stuff that you didn't enjoy or don't enjoy when leaders do to you. Stuff that makes you, you know, shrink back in your leadership. Think that, not to make, that makes you a worse follower, that, that, that limits your growth. Don't do those things. For example, when you are validated by a leader, when your opinion is asked for, when your time is valued, when a guy arrives on time who's leading you, where a guy speaks well to you, where a lady prays for you and does things that, that make you want to follow them, do those things to those following after you. Whatever you want done to you, do those things to others. And then secondly, second uh, thing to watch out for, second parting comment. Don't fear failure. In case you don't realize this, the second you start to lead, you're starting to some kind of failure. That's going to come. If you want to you know, have leadership with no failure, that's a pipe dream. It's never going to happen. Leadership does have with it some sort of failure at some point, at some place. Accept that. Settle that. But failure should never stop us from starting the issue of leadership. Here's a quote, an incredible quote. I'm going to read it. It's quite a long quote, but I'll read it out because I think it's, it's so deep. It's so impactful. Outside of the Bible, this is one of the most amazing comments on leadership. Said by Teddy Roosevelt, who was a, a U.S. president uh, decades ago. It's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So, so his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. What a horrible place to be, never knowing victory or defeat. What a great place to be where your success is this great success, but where when you, when you fail, or the worst can happen to you is that you fail at least daring greatly. What a great call for us as leaders. We've got to not be the person on the grandstand whining and complaining at the team on the field, but get onto the field, put our boots on, and get stuck in. We can't afford to fear failure. What a great gift. What a great thing that we've all got to some or other degree, and that we're all called to develop. You see, we started off the series by saying, saying, What's our design? Who's our designer? And we said at the start as well, how can I do better and grow and develop this gift? What a great thing to develop. I want to end by saying this. As leaders, all of us are followers. Of people, yes, but principally we're followers of Jesus Christ. The greatest leader who ever lived. Undoubtedly the perfect leader who's never made a mistake. Who's gracious who's kind, who's skillful, who's generous, who's wise and able to teach us all on the specific journey we're on, a personal rabbi, a personal mentor, a personal teacher, a personal leader, a personal coach, a personal older brother. What an incredible leader. And what a joy to know that as we're asking God to hone our skills as leaders, we get to follow Christ, his example, but also we get to walk into a future as he opens the doors for us. The Bible says he's gone ahead of us preparing in advance great works for us to do to his glory and to his honor. I want to urge you, keep on, don't stop, aim at Jesus, be like Jesus, and lead his people well. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of leadership. Thank you for the joy. 
that we've got of being in team with you. What a great privilege to be, to get to be team players on the team, the greatest team, the team that Jesus leads. God, we are so happy. We're so thrilled when we have fears, when we're sad, when we have regret. God, we get to come to you to be cleaned and washed and rejuvenated and encouraged again. When we have success, when we see fruit, we get to come in on our knees, humble ourselves and say, God, it's all you. It's all for you. It's all through you. It's all by you. God, we love you so.